Hollywood Kitchen. And this is the first time I have been able to do an episode fully in person with my guests. So, <laughs> yeah, that is so exciting. Yay. We're currently in the, yes. we are currently in the historic home of Miss Janet Klein. And today we're going to do an episode all about the food, the career, and the life of celebrated tap dancer Eleanor Powell. And we could not think of a better guest than tap expert Rusty Rank. So welcome Rusty, welcome Janet, and I am so excited to be here. So we are going to do a deep dive into Eleanor Powell's career and also we're going to make a recipe attributed to her called sweet potato croquettes. Aww. <laughs> sweet potato. Yeah. A little bit about Eleanor Powell for those of you who may not know. She was born in 1912 and started out on the stage and on Broadway before Hollywood came calling. And her film career lasted from about 1930 to 1945. She was married to actor Glenn Ford, who was famous for his many co-starring roles opposite Rita Hayworth, and they had a son named Peter Ford. So Eleanor left the screen for quite a while to be a mother, and then eventually she returned to performing and had a show in Las Vegas. So that's a little bit about her life, but we're going to explore her life, her career, and a lot of stuff today on Hollywood Kitchen. Yeah. And I would like to just add one thing. Is that yes. okay? Oh, okay. sure. Of course. Uh, when I was growing up, I always heard Eleanor Powell described as the best female tap dancer. And that always upset me. Because I said, well, she's just one of the best tap dancers. Yeah, why does it have to be? Yeah, the so, so I want to say that Eleanor Powell was simply one of the best tap dancing performing artists of the 30s and 40s. Period. Okay. End of story. Yeah. Because we can say those things now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so should we start? Yes. Ooh, but potato croquettes. Sweet potatoes. <laughs> sweet potato croquettes. Mm, yeah. Okay, let's do it. Okay. Okay. We are going to make Eleanor Powell's sweet potato croquettes. And here are the items we'll need to do it. Okay, we have half teaspoon of nutmeg and one fourth teaspoon of cinnamon mixed in this handy thing. Then we have, let's see, two tablespoons of brown sugar right here. We have a pinch of salt. We have, uh, let's see, two tablespoons of finely chopped shredded for you. Coconut. Look at that, finely shredded. <laughs> Very nice. A uh, yolk of one egg. I'm not going to tip this too much because it will spill. And we've got four large sweet potatoes that have been boiled, cooled, mashed, and ready for us to cook with. So Janet, you have been testing this recipe for us, and you are the guru of sweet potato croquettes. So <laughs> walk recipe and I through this process. All right. So here we go. Take your mashed sweet potatoes, and you add the spices and the brown sugar. Do, do, do. Salt to your hands, pinch of salt, rub those in, in together. And then we mix this up. And um, so it is a little bit of a, uh, um, a messy thing. And in the meantime, while we are mixing and roly pulling with, with our croquettes, um, I'm heating some uh, canola oil. In the background right there. On the stove. So as soon as we get a few of these little croquettes going, then I'll, I'll put it on the stove. And Janet, you had mentioned that after you mash up the large four sweet potatoes, that you put it in the refrigerator, which kind of helps firm it up a little bit and helps yeah. with the cooking process. Because it is a little gooey. Yeah, but it's it's fun. fun. And uh, you know what I realized? I, at first, when I saw this recipe, I thought, oh, she, she must have been a Southern girl, because this sounds like a Southern dish. Um, and, uh, but in fact, she was born in Springfield, Massachusetts. So there. So in a way, it's a little bit like a potato lucky. It's a lot like that. <laughs> but it's, but it's a sweet potato with, uh, with, with, uh, Is that brown sugar breaking up? Spices. Yes. Okay. There you go. Okay. okay. All right. So there you go. So now you will take some and. All right. So how do you want to do the first? Uh, she says making these into little cylinders is best. Okay. All right. Oh, so yeah. you take your nice. roll. The first okay. is roll it in the flour. Okay. And then into the roll egg. it in the egg. <laughs> so good. And then ooh, since we're doing an assembly, assembly line. line. Ooh, it's all gooey. <laughs> I know. Right? This is, okay. Ooh. And then I roll it in a, <laughs> one more time in the coconut. Yes. Red crumbs. Okay. 
So Janet, are you going to go over to the stove and start yeah, doing this? Yeah, let's, okay. let's, uh, okay. let's do Okay, so we'll take the babies. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, maybe I can do it like this and cover it in flour from above. Ooh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it is gooey. Um, please wear an apron and get ready for a lot of messiness. Right. <laughs> Here we go. And if you have toddlers, get them to help you with this. It'll be fun. Yeah, we'll take you all about, uh, two years to clean your home. Uh, let's see. Okay. Okay. So again, this ends up being um, kind of a, like a little sweet potato pot. We're kind of running a little low on egg. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. I think we're we're there, girls. We're almost there. Oh my gosh. Okay. So to tell you the truth, this is a half a recipe. So this was two potatoes. Okay. Because I, I, like I said, I made it before, and it, it could have. Fed an army. Some of these recipes are just outrageously large, and for those of us who like have smaller households, it's definitely good to reduce the recipe. Yeah. Oh, sure. We'll have a big cocktail party. Uh, yeah, there you go. Well, you know, eventually I would love to do Hollywood Kitchen dinner parties and have like a big dinner party with tons of people cooking tons oh, of stuff. Yeah. I, I've got a vision for the future of this for sure, but the pandemic kind of changed my game a little bit for the time being. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm ready to go. Okay, I'm ready to take some little babies to the you food. take them yeah. away. All right, and here we go. Make more room for you to do this. So hold on. Okay, so the oil is heated, and I think she said something like if you have a, a thermometer, she makes a note on the temperature. Um, but I just have a cast iron skillet, nice, and, and I do not have a thermometer for it, so but it, this works. Okay. okay. We'll just have to eyeball it. And I've got if you if I could get the the uh, uh, coconut back. Yes, one moment I'm just gonna put these in so they're all going. Ooh, fun. Ooh. These layers of rolling. Ooh. It is and fun. You've you got can. a big thing of flour over the side. I know. So. <laughs> <laughs> you should you need some flour. I do, I do. Put some there. <laughs> it's like I'm, I'm very theatrical. The effort must show, right? Uh, the effort must, yeah, must show. I, I can only imagine that if this were in a movie, they would, you know, put a little <laughs> drop of makeup. Sounds <sighs> good, girls. Okay. Oh, it does. I wish we had smell of vision. Every episode in your like, Hollywood kitchen, I have longed for smell of vision. It would now, be so I, fun. I think, you know, one of the challenges so far has been to get the coconut to stick. stick. That's yeah, I'm noticing. Oh, that. Now, you know, it doesn't, it, it's light coconut, so you oh, don't okay. need to. Oh, work. all right. So now I've got all this nice goop left. So I'm going to bring these over to Janet. Okay. All right. And Janet is hard at work at the deep fryer and the cast iron skillet. Oh, yeah. and very soon we will awesome. have the final product. Oh, oh my God. God. I'm going to sort of uh, try to turn them a little bit. Yes. I guess we just, just, hold, just hold for me one second and I'll make room. Mm. Yeah. I am saying, Ooh. help the birds. Is that the you wash your hands. Okay, I'll I'll do it after after you do. Oh. All right, I'm ready for the. Oh, the, the I got you ready. Room. Yeah, you got room, baby. I got room. Hey, you got. Room. Okay. Gonna get up really fast. Wash your hands. Complicated, so it's good to kind of take things and steps and learn right. and gradually. And it seems just so like well. assembling, assembling, cooking, and then uh, parting. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so she says to uh, serve this with a little uh, chopped parsley or, and or lemon 
uh, oh. wedges. So I have that ready to go. Oh, okay. very cool. You're beautiful. Very cool. You're beautiful. Can you name this style of plate? Franciscan ware. Yes. Oh, that's beautiful. Desert, 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 desert rose. rose. Desert rose. Desert rose. I love that. They look right. They're adorable. Oh, I wish I had a camera to like see. There they are. It's sizzling away. Boy, that looks delicious and smells delicious. Now, I, what I love is that this is an Eleanor Powell dish and you can hear the rhythm, the rhythm of the sizzling. Oh, listen, so listen, awesome. listen, folks. Fascinating rhythm, you got to come back up. The rhythm of the sizzle. <laughs> First of all, everybody show their beautiful These are so fancy and beautiful and Janet Klein's. Aren't they gorgeous? <laughs> oh, actually, I flipped it over to see where they're from and I don't have my glasses on. Oh. Uh, I have my contacts in and I still can't read it, but oh well. Uh, oh, Lo and Bijou. Well, Lo and Bijou. Okay. Okay. But Germany. Here is what the final product look like. Isn't that pretty? These are gorgeous. They look delicious. And I, for one, am very excited to try one. Yeah. So can we do that? Yes. Dig in, girl. Oh, they break right apart right when you Oops. stack into them. Oh, want to go for another one? Sure. Can I say a little bit of lemon is good with this? So okay. Give it a little slice of lemon. All right. And, okay. and let's see. Say, happy tapping. Bon appetit. Mm. Good. Mm. Oh, my God. Mm. Oh, my God. Mm. Oh, my God. Yay. Yay. Mm. This is a winner. Mm -hmm. This is a winner. And it's got sizzle. <laughs> it's got sizzle. It's got rhythm. It's got everything. I, you know, I would eat this at Thanksgiving. That's like an alternative Thanksgiving potato, but I'd eat this anytime, actually, not yeah. just at Thanksgiving. I think all those flavors, I, they're really mm, they're really coming through. Yeah, the first time I did it with a little chicken and okra, because it just seemed like a, mm, a southern, a southern mm -hmm. bell kind of dish. But it would taste the cinnamon, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I it's, love the lemon. Mm. Yay! This is a, a chorus of flavor. It is. It really it's is. It's surprising flavor. because you're just looking at it and you know it's a sweet potato, but all those and flavors. And yam things, but they don't often, I mean, I've never had a, a yam dish with coconut. Mm-mm. Mm -hmm. oh. no. you like it. This is it's very, and it's lighter than you would think. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a lightness to it, for sure. Yeah, almost a puppy quality. Mm -hmm. But I never thought I would talk about sweet potato. <laughs> Mm. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. And the yeah. coconut has a little bit of crispiness and mm -hmm. texture, which is also really great. Mm. I think the first time I made it, and they were a little darker too, and they were also delicious. I just um, was conscious about the burning coconut. Yeah. Because when I did it by myself, I did it more in batches, and so some of the coconut ended up being in there longer. So oh, right. this was actually really good assembly line work, girls. You know, uh -huh. I find with a lot of Halloween Kitchen episodes I've done, I wind up making the food multiple times. And the first time, it's not the same as the second time as the third. Like, it kind of gets better. I kind of figure it out more and more as I go right. along. Yeah. I think this actually mm -hmm. might be the first time that I've ever eaten on camera. <laughs> this is what I'm gonna find out. My mother, my mother had this saying all the time when I was growing up. I had horrible table manners, you know. I'd oh, be like this, yeah. And she'd say, "Honey, someday you're gonna be out with a nice young man." <laughs> it was always that a nice young man. So you have good table manners. Uh -huh. Let's see what kind of table manners that nice young man. Has. Yeah. Well, all right, girls. Where are we? So this is delicious. <laughs> Ladies, thank you so much for joining me today on Hollywood Kitchen. This was a delightful episode. And it's really delightful because it's in person. Yes. So, Janet, follow my lead. <laughs> Yay! And please stay with us for more food, fun, and film history coming to you from Hollywood Kitchen. Thank you for bringing us to well, I've got some Eleanor Powell goodies here. That's it. Hi. I'm so tight. So I, over the years, somehow, just through con connections and luck and friends, I met Eleanor Powell's son, Peter Ford. And he loves tap dancers, and he's always been uh, embracing of us and brings us around and imparts some of his mom's stuff. He, he was a, just a big fan of his mom, so he occasionally sends me a box of stuff. So uh, I have some treasures here that are directly from Eleanor Powell. And I got them through her son, uh, Peter Ford, who's a big fan of tap dancing and tap dancers. So first of all, we must point out that this 
sweater was Eleanor Powell's. Yeah. It showed up one day in a little box at my front door, and it was, uh, he said, some rusty, some things I found growing through some old boxes for your Eleanor Powell collection. Oh my God, yes, Peter. Great. So this sweater is just so adorable. Um, Janet noted that it's got this adorable little beading work on it. I mean, never seen yeah, this kind of thing before. So uh, I must wear it. Now this was one of her canes. Okay, with tap dancers often use canes, so that's really fun. And I'm gonna give that to you to hold, so you can hold something that wow. Eleanor Powell held. Okay, of course, you're never supposed to put shoes on the table unless they're Eleanor Powell shoes. Magic shoes. Yeah. <laughs> so these are just good old Capizios. These are the, they, these were the go, one of the go-to models of tap shoes in, in the day. But what's beautiful about these is they have a little cutout right here that you can see. And fascinating is the bottom. I'm gonna hold it real steady. There's a little sinker right here which is uh, something that people don't do so much anymore, if at all, but I did this too when I was uh, in my 20s. We used to have a sinker in there. And then it's got the, the Morgan tap, which was a very popular tap to use. That's what my teacher, Louis Decon, used. And then it's got a plate here. So this will give her even more sound. Most dancers put rubber right here, but she put this plate, um, and I didn't get to ask her why, so we'll just assume that it was for creating more sound. You can see how reinforced this shoe is. I'm going to point out it's got a heel brace right here. You can see it is hammered in there so that her heel won't break off. We've all had that happen to us, us tap dancers. We've all had our heels fly out. I once was in a show where my heel flew out and somebody in the audience caught it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, these are also hammered in. The taps are hammered in, everything. So that's her uh, beautiful. What does the sinker do? Uh, it's just a tap sound. That's all. It makes a different sound. Okay rather than a solid tap there, which is usually, this This is the tap here on the front, usually there's an equivalent on the heel. But this was, uh, many people used to do that. So we'll put the taps here. I know, it's amazing. And then, this is so cute, it's a little Eleanor Powell lighter. <laughs> okay, and I'm gonna hand this to Jan. It's got a cute little image of Eleanor Powell, uh, and she used to give this to people and it says with deep appreciation because that it's so delicate and cute yes mm. so there's the Eleanor Powell lighter and then these are fun these are just like little this is a little card that has her name on it, it just says Eleanor Powell it's just a little you know embossed fancy card with the, the little envelope that goes with it and this has this is a, a little card that you would present and it just has her old address, 1012 Cove Way. And here's an envelope. <laughs> I love these little things, you know, these little memorabilia. And then this is something that Betsy Beto's gave me. And it is a costume of Eleanor Powell's from probably the 60s when she was uh, doing her shows in Las Vegas. And it's made, it's got a tag in here by the costumer Lloyd Lambert. And you can look up Lloyd Lambert made costumes for Hollywood. Mm -hmm. But Janet and I were looking at the detail. So first of all, there's beautiful little rhinestones here, buttons, uh, rhinestone buttons all the way down. All of this, this sequence. sequin work, sequin works, and then the little tails in the back, and then on the underside of the tails is sequence. sequins. And then is a zip all the way up. But here's something kind of fun. It's got these little three buttons down here. And zip. So you can get it. Just, oh, just spit. You can get in there and then it's just gonna stay there. It's not gonna slide up. It's gonna hold in place when you're lifting your arm up and dancing. So I know that uh, that we have more of my memorabilia that I couldn't bring over here, like my Eleanor Powell steamer trunk that I also got through Peter Ford and some other things, some big things, posters from her show in Vegas, but those, Janet will be presenting to Great. you. But yeah. isn't this lovely? Yeah. Wonderful to so, see. I love it. It's, it's, I'll tell you the story of this too. Mm. <laughs> this is a little something from the Watson family archive. There's a little promo piece, Legendary Legs from Delmer Watson. They were, uh, he was a famous uh, photographer in Los Angeles with a big family that, uh, that participated, all the kids participated in silent movies. And the dad was known as Fire, Wire, and Water Watson because he was a gag man. 
So and, and there were tons of kids, and they were um, in talkies a lot. You can see Delmar; he's in lots of things. I believe he's in that Shirley Temple movie Heidi, and he's in loads and loads of them. And of course, Bob's Bob's Watson, the, the kid that was the best crier of the family. He was a freck guy. Uh, no, just Delmar. had that cute little round face, and he was in Boys Town and all these movies. They were really talented. And um, while we're on Eleanor Palbert, one of the things is that the father never put any of the kids under contract at any of the studios, so he could always demand the price he wanted. So they were not under those uh, big <laughs> seven-year contracts or anything. All right, that's our memorabilia. Whee! <laughs> so now we're going to talk about Eleanor Powell's, uh, some of her outstanding attributes as a dancer. So you're pretty impressed with Eleanor Powell, aren't you? Well, I have to say, uh, I feel like I'm watching a magician. So somebody that's just put in endless hours and showing you something that's extravaganza style and smooth and you can't possibly know the half of what's going into this. So we were talking about um, the way that those things were filmed. Yeah, well, let, me, let me start a little bit by telling people that um, one of the things that's super special about Eleanor Powell is that she was one of the very, very few who did all of her own choreography without an assistant. So it, uh, if you don't know this already, but Fred Astaire always had an assistant. Mostly it was Hermes Pan and Gene Kelly had an assistant. These assistants would work with them, collaborating, coming up with those ideas, and then remembering it so that it could be brought back the next day when they're going over it. Because remember, these were the days where there was no iPhones where you could record what you did. You just had to do it and remember it. So it was real collaborative in those days. It'd be a rehearsal pianist, the star, like Fred Astaire or Gene Kelly or Ann Miller or Eleanor Powell. And then usually they had assistants. But Eleanor Powell did all of her own choreography. It was very, very rare. The other thing about her is that, as Bayard Nicholas of the Nicholas Brothers said, she could do it all. When I asked him, who's your favorite tap dancer, he said, Eleanor Powell. And I was surprised, of all the tap dancers, he picked Eleanor Powell. And I asked him, I said, why? And he said, because she could do everything. She could sing, she could dance, she could do acrobatics. And, and the more you dig into Eleanor Powell, you see that she, she could do lariat roping. She learned how to do that, did a whole number with that. That's unbelievable. And also, like Fred Astaire, she also believed in the long take. So what do we mean by long take? Not a lot of cutting. So in the beginning of movies, first they just filmed dance numbers like they were filming a Broadway show. Just one shot, everybody's on stage. And then they realized, wait a second, we have a little, we have a little flexibility here because we can move the camera. The dancers can, we can do a tight shot far away. So what happened next? It became like a nightmare. They were filming the dancer's feet and then the reaction, here's the reaction. Right. <laughs> okay. And then uh, it just got out of control. Or versus like some of the early film musicals, it looked like the cameras were very stationary and it was like you were sitting in the audience of a big theatrical yes. show. And so they were very static and distant. Yes. And so, you can tell that things developed from there. Yeah. So anyway, as we were saying right there, was that that's when um, the dance started getting revolutionized. And by who? By the artists. So Fred Astaire was the first that we know of who said, no, I want one shot head to toe, as, as little cutting as possible. I think after he saw one of the, the first films, the second film he was in, which was Flying Down to Rio, he saw all these cuts to reaction shots, to feet, and he said, no, I want it to be like you are in the audience watching it, but let the camera move. So again, this collaborative effort. Well, Eleanor Powell is the same. If you go in and look at her numbers, you're gonna see very few cuts. As a matter of fact, you kind of have to go like this, hold your eyes open to even find the cuts because they're so few and far between that if you blink, you might miss the one or two that are in the number. So I admire her tremendously, not only for her creativity and her fabulous time in tap dancing, but all of this, this other elements that go into making an amazing presentation. Boss. <laughs> and also she would do, uh, you know, back in the day, I'm gonna just back up. They, they said there were so many tap dancers, tap dancers were a dime a dozen, and you had to do something that set yourself apart. Well, we know that Eleanor Powell can dance, that she can tap, but what can she do each time she makes a movie and presents a number to make it different? One of my favorite numbers, and I know it's one of yours too, is with buttons. Buttons the doggy, and 
we're going to show you a clip of it so you can see it. And the thing that you're going to notice about this number is that it's really done again in these long takes with very few cuts. And Elmer Pell trained the dog herself. So she did it on her own again, again, this training this dog to do these tricks as she's dancing around the room. So you're going to enjoy that. And yeah. then she makes a comment about, you don't like the hula, do you? And he yeah. starts dancing. <laughs> <laughs> covers his eyes. <laughs> it's just adorable. Yeah, you get a sense, and I think that that's something that we agree on, that she just comes across as such a genuinely nice person. And everything that we've ever heard from anybody who knew her, that she was just that, just a kind, nice person. Right. Um, another thing that I like to tell everybody is the complexity of filming these numbers. And because you don't see it, you just, as Janet says, it just one of the, one of, almost a problem is that she makes it look so effortless. You may not be aware of the hard work that went into it, okay? So just one of the things that is interesting is how the dubbing process works. And most people don't know about this, but when they do a big production number, they can't record the audio at that time because the dancer is moving around so much. So there's nobody can follow and run around the set with a big boom microphone. So they actually have to put in the audio of the taps after. And so the process is from beginning to end, I'll keep it real short and sweet, is that Eleanor Powell would have been working with a rehearsal pianist as she's making up the number. And this rehearsal pianist then will They'll bounce ideas back and forth. They have this song they're supposed to do, let's say, Lady Be Good or Fascinating Rhythm, and they create this sketch. The, this rehearsal pianist then meets with the orchestrator and explains that this is where the trumpet should come in and then she wants a big drum right here or whatever. He then relays that to the orchestrator. Then the orchestrator makes the orchestration and then the orchestration is brought to the orchestra and then they record it. Now, this recording is then used, is used as a playback for when filming is done. Okay? So then as they're filming it on the big set, this is, record, this is played and then the dancer and everything is filmed to this playback. Now what happens? Now the film has to be cut together. Oh, and at this point, you may notice that if you look real hard, you're rarely gonna see the dancer wear tap shoes because they don't need to. And taps on shoes can be notoriously slippery on floors. So they can, you don't wanna take that risk. So they would just wear a, the, a shoe that they would be wearing with that costume. Then maybe three weeks later, four weeks later, the film is all edited and cut together. And then the dancer will go into the recording studio. Uh, and this recording studio would have a place for the film to be projected. The dancer will have headsets on that will be hanging from a grid above that will be on a floor that has microphones all around it. And then they will have a click track and the music will start, and then they have to replicate what they did on the screen. However, without any turns, without taking their eye off the camera. So if they had done one thing where they went, they couldn't do that when they were dubbing it because they had to keep the eye on the, can on the screen so that they would see when that turn was finished to make the right sounds. So it's really tricky. And if they were dancing on different surfaces, like she might go from a drum onto a chair, onto a pool deck, <laughs> and all those sounds have to be like the sound that she's dancing on. So in this dubbing, they would have all these different things around. To do. Bony, bony, bony. yeah. <laughs> wow. And so uh, that was also something that they had to work on real hard to get the best sound for taps. So you can see it wasn't easy, but they made it look easy with their, as the old saying, hide your hard work behind your artistry. I know that she started in ballet. And so that's also seems something that really comes through. Okay, because this is a fascinating story. So she started in ballet and acrobatics and she was trying to get on into Broadway shows and that she was, she could never get, she auditioned and she just wasn't getting in. And they said, well, you've got to learn how to tap dance. And she kept saying, I hate tap dancing. I hate it. And they, and, and then they said, you've got to learn it. Nobody quite understood why she hated it. This, I hated it. And so she, she signed up for a series of 10 classes with Jack Donahue, as I understand it, who was one of the premier performing um, musical comedy performing stars of that age. And she signed up for the lessons. And after the first class, she didn't come back. 
and he, she was already known around the Broadway circle. So he called her up and said, I, why didn't you come to the next lesson? And she says, well, I just hate it, I hate it. And he says, but why? You should come back and we took it. And she says, I just hate it. And he says, wait a second. You come into the studio with me and I want to see what's going on. And so she came back to the studio with him and he said, okay, show me what you learned in that lesson last week. And so she did the step and he said, mm, okay, I'll be right back. And he went into the other room and he brought in sandbags, which he tied to her and then she could do it. And what it was that she had so much lift from ballet that she wasn't grounded to do the taps. And the minute he anchored her to the floor, that changed everything forever. So thank goodness for good teachers, right? <laughs> so, and, and from then on, I, she learned the 10 lessons and began teaching the classes, assisting, and then the rest is history. She got into the Broadway shows and, and we know her as a tap dancer now. We don't know her or think of her as an acrobatic ballet person, though she was equally adept at those dances. So that's one of my favorite the, stories too. The thing that too. comes through her, her style of dancing is that she does these balletic turns yeah. that are like nobody else. Yeah, they're amazing turns. And she holds her hands like, like this, but kind of down like this, kind of like little <laughs> paws. It's so cute. It's uniquely hers style. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so great. Um, one other thing that I wanted, because I know we can we can show this too to everybody, is how hard some of the numbers we have filmed. And one of them is a number called Fascinating Rhythms, Fascinating Rhythm. And she is dancing with a series of boogie woogie piano players. And they're fabulous. They're all one by one beating out this rhythm for her. And it's just solid boogie woogie. And she's tapping right next to them. And it just looks like one beautiful number. But somebody was on the set filming it because it was a technical uh, puzzle to do this. Because as you can watch these, they put it together side by side. You can see that as she's tapping, they're pulling out pieces of the stage. And there's this, it looks to me like a hundred crew running around doing all this because they have to pull out the stages with a piano player on it. She dances over to the next one. Then they pull that one out. Then she moves over to the next one. And meanwhile, the lighting, the lighting is coming in, the camera is coming in. And, and she just, you would have no idea by her expression as she's dancing that any of this commotion, because this is all, this is all machines, <laughs> equipment that's all going to, and somebody's, call, I, I guess, is the, okay, let's move in camera number five. Let's, okay, let's, okay, pull out the stage. Okay, pianist number one, you, you move off to stage right. Yeah, and all of this would be having cheese. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so they must have had that playback going real loud. It's so great. Yeah. I love her. She's amazing. And I'm just sad I never met her. I never met her. And I think of all the people I, I have met and would love to have met, she's certainly at the top of my list. She's a real inspiration to me. Definitely. Because you got to look for Rusty's book, which is all this beautiful oral histories. Yeah. So I, I, the, the oral histories in this, uh, that I did. I started in 1987 and she had passed away already. So I missed her just by that much. And I think this is one of the reasons why I did the book because that generation of dancers was just starting to go. I know that you got uh, Buddy Epson and his wife, Velma. Uh, actually, you. that's his sister. Oh, did I say wife? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sister Velma. Yeah, they were in a lot of the movies. Yeah, right? they were. Well, they were in, uh, he was in several movies with her. Um, and but Vilma was in the Broadway Melody of 1936, and they do that adorable you know, sing, sing before, before breakfast. breakfast. <laughs> the bird is all along. Before you eat your butter toast, sing a song. <laughs> Something like that. Yay. Okay. So we are going to go through a PowerPoint deck, and Rusty's going to kind of take us through these slides. Yeah, I, I, I've always loved this one. For some reason, there were always these portraits of dancers on rooftops. <laughs> they, there's some of Fred Astaire on rooftops. So this would have been on the rooftop of one of the studios. Okay, we can advance. Oh, this is uh, from the Rosalie number. It's just so beautiful at set. She comes down this giant staircase of drums. Always her costumes are so beautiful. All right. Oh, just how can you get more deco than that? Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. This has always been one of my favorites. I actually have this framed in my home right next to my Eleanor Pell tap shoes. I love this. I love that costume. I think uh, 
here's an opportunity for everybody to look at her lines. Line that is a word expression dancers use to show off the, the lines that you create with your body. So look at the two different lines that each of her legs gives, her arms up to the hat, and the costume also plays a part in this. So just wonderful. For costumers, designing a costume that dancers had to dance in must be an extra challenge because it's got to be very movable and look yeah. right on screen when they're dancing, have right. them be able to have that flexibility. Absolutely, and they would do little tricks so that the dancer could raise their arm without getting caught, lifted. Yeah. Okay. Did she design that costume? I don't know. Wait, yeah, I don't know. Hmm. Uh, and this is, look at that bolero jacket with the fringe, that's just so great, yeah. And then adding more excitement to them, it's already an exciting number, just having this fringe on her, her little shorts. The, that, yeah. Fringe seems to dance with the dance. Exactly, yeah. Oh, oh and there, there's an example, a little bit of her acrobatic ability in this number, and she does a lot of that sort of thing. But she was famous for this one move where she would do a back bend and tap the, the ground with her hand. Yeah. So. <laughs> I kind of wonder if she had cartilage or her body was cartilage. <laughs> no, she had years and years of practice. That too. That That's too. what she had. Okay. Yeah, just the best sheet music cover ever. Oh, All right. Or just, and there's that kind of a similar move pose. All right. Well, Janet Klein and I love this number because there's Gracie Allen with her ukulele. Oh, hey. Yeah. I'm on my merry way. Now, here is something I want everybody to look at really closely. You, in the top picture, you see Eleanor Powell's shoes. They're on a glass. You don't see the glass right now, but that there's a glass that she's tap dancing on. It's like a, they're on a, a, they're going over to Honolulu on a ship and that's just a windbreak, a glass windbreak. And she taps on that. And you can see the shoes she's wearing here don't have taps on them, they have wood soles. And um, I believe that's a wood sole shoe. And those were common also with Bill Robinson and other dancers. Uh, also, Ruby Keeler wore wood sole shoes so that they wow. could make the sounds uh, with their feet. Using the I'm always in awe watching these films of these dancers, especially on the big screen. Yes. Yeah. So impactful. Okay, next slide. Oh, just the best um, number of the two of them ever, ever. It's, uh, it's considered one of the best tap numbers ever filmed. Not, not it, there's uh, uh, this upper tier. And this would be on that upper tier, like the Nicholas Brothers from Stormy Weather. Yes. And all, and yeah, every, but this is just a beautiful number. And what a nice poster. Here we go, next one. And again, this is so from the same movie. They only worked together once. And oh. that dress is so lovely. It's, it's just, it moves with her dancing. It, it's so much more material than if you just see her standing in it. You can't imagine how much material is in it until she starts dancing and how it floats. Oh. The begin the beginning number. They do uh, another number in the movie together, which is called the jukebox number, which is very, very popular amongst tap dancers. And many tap dancers have recreated both of these numbers. And then Lady Be Good has some wonderful numbers in it, including another group of dancers called the Berry Brothers. They do a spectacular, they do their act in this. They were phenomenal. I'm noticing the line of her body on yeah. the post. Now that you've told me about the lines, <laughs> I notice it in everything yeah. I see now. And that is something that I love about this era of dancers is they they said every, every move should be a picture. And I noticed that oftentimes when people would take photographs of me when I was performing, there would always be this awkward moment where my hand is in or I've got some weird line with my body. And I thought, how did they do that? And it, and it's just a study of how you move to make sure that you're going from one pose to the other without an awkward position getting in the way. So I can make a recommendation to anybody who's watching this if you're intrigued by this concept. Go on to YouTube and watch Fred Astaire, the Nicholas Brothers, Eleanor Powell, anybody you want from that golden era. And YouTube has this uh, little, little gear that you can slow down the movie. Slow it down and watch and you won't see a bad frame. Yeah, you gotta do it in slow motion to catch that. Okay, next. Uh, Another line. Yes, I know. <laughs> I'm obsessed now with that. I know, that's what sets each dancer apart. They they become a unique entity. Okay, next. Oh, this is the one. Yeah, and these are my posters that uh, were given to me by her son, Peter, Peter Ford, gave me these, they, they're not posters, they're posters on like wood board. And they were from her act. Unfortunately, there somebody poked a lot of holes in them, but it's still wonderful to see. It would have been from her Vegas act, 
and there's four male dancers that were in this act with her. And the second one from the left is my friend Howard Krieger, who toured, toured with her. And he just said, he couldn't say anything but nice things about Ola Rapel because apparently she was just the nicest person ever. So a lesson to us all, you can be a big star and famous and still be super nice. Lines, lines. So here she would have been, I, I reckon in her 50s at this wow. point. Wow. Yeah. Dang. Oh, I love that picture. That's so sweet. Another line. Yep. Oh, and here is the famous. This is the famous Eleanor Powell steamer trunk. I always dreamed about having a steamer drunk trunk in my house for some reason. The idea was, I, to me, it's evocative of tra obviously travel, but of adventure and experiences. And, and when I had this opportunity to get this, in, and it was uh, Peter Ford was selling a lot of his mom's and dad's stuff in auction, but he let a bunch of us tap dancers know so we could have first pick. And so I thought, I must have this steamer truck. He had about, I'm trying to remember how many he had, like 10 of these. And she would carry all these around with all of her costumes and props oh, and shoes and all this. So this one, we're guessing it's from, it's from the 20s or 30s. It's got the Dorchester Hotel. I think we'll see that label on it in a moment. But what I have here is that costume we saw in their, uh, her tap shoes up above there. And I also have Kim Berry's tap shoes there up above, another one of my favorites. And those are my clothes inside, but that's her cane. And, but it's just a beautiful trunk. It's so gorgeous. Oh, it's like a work of art. It is. And you can see how people could actually live out of a trunk when you were oh, yeah. on tour. If it's that kind of trunk, yeah. sure. <laughs> okay. And there's the Dorchester oh, wow. Hotel, which if you know anything about London, that is a premier hotel to stay in. Okay. And that's our costume. Okay. And this is a big hat box. Now, this hat box is not made of paper. It is some very strong material. It's quite large. It's, it's about a... Not quite as big as this table, but maybe about this this big. It's quite large. So, and just hand painted EP on it. And this was another thing her son every now and then will call me and say, I've got some more stuff for you, Rusty. <laughs> and and you don't know this yet, but this was Eleanor Powell's sweater. Oh, oh that is so cool. <laughs> know. This showed up in a box one day saying, I know this that you all appreciate it. Maybe you can wear it. And it fit. Oh my God. Okay, that was meant to be. So, yeah. Janet, you're an excellent parkway operator. Oh, behind yeah. the camera there. It's good to have you my trigger for <laughs> So that was fun. Yeah, that was great. Yes, so, thank you for taking us through Eleanor uh, Powell's life. Uh, love now, you know, I think you did mention the beginning of the game I remember. And uh, do you know anything about that? I, I the, the bits and pieces I know the way about. They work together. Yeah, they seem friends. Yes. Right? So Esther and Powell, they when they got teamed together. The whole world was so excited, the whole world of people who were fans, because that you had these two top dancers finally getting to appear together. And it took a while. This was not till 1940, so they would have been filming it, I guess, 1939. But uh, the story goes that for about three weeks, they just kept talk, calling each other Mr. Stare and Miss Hal. And finally, there was this moment that I've heard over and over again that and she, you can hear her tell the story, that finally they got through something in a rehearsal, and they were so excited that Stare lifted her up. And, and they looked at each other and she said, oh, Mr. Stare, thank you. And he said, can we now just say Ellie and Fred? <laughs> so there was that moment where finally they were, because they were just so excited about working, working on material and coming up with such fun stuff. So that was nice that they had such a high regard for each other, but finally were able to just be to have a good time tapping together without the, the formality. But the other thing is, it's that if you watch the begin the begin number, you're going to notice that there's a lot of elements of it. First of all, it's that shiny floor that the studio loved to use. So whenever you, sometimes you can find these clips where the, where they would do a take and then these guys would come up with mops, all these guys come out with mops and clean all the little footprints out. And you'll notice at the beginning, it's a pristine, like almost like a mirror floor. And then as it goes on, you'll start seeing a little bit of the scratches from their tapping, but mostly it's uh, pristine. The interesting thing to me about that number and I'm sure somebody's delved into this, but there's a, a big mirror, there's mirrors and there's a band playing and there's all of this stars projected. And I've always wondered how the story behind filming that because of the, that humongous mirror so, that they don't get the cameras in it. They had to face them a certain direction. So take a look at that. There's so many things to look at in that number. And also the entire first part is all one take. There's no cuts. 
And um, I have to say that the difference between a take and a cut is interesting. So a take is filming the number and cuts are how you edit it. So um, they probably would have done several takes of the number. There's all these notorious stories about how sometimes they dancers had to do 100 takes and their shoes, their feet are bleeding and all this. But in this case, they would have done several and to, to be pleased with their work. But then there would have been different cuts where, where the editor is cutting together. So, they, so, but there was also that uh, story that Eleanor Powell tells about doing this, filming it. And they said, let's do it one more time. Let's do it one more time. Because they were both perfectionists. And finally, I think one of them said, look, if we keep, or the director said, if we keep doing this one more time, because they said, let's do it one more time. If we keep doing this one more time, we'll never get out of here. <laughs> so I love that. But I think that the two of them just, having the same approach to dance, both being perfectionists, both being, is what, what did Fred Astaire call tap dancing? So is it? Uh, Fred Astaire said that there's no, that, that it's like equivalent work to ditch digging. Yeah. That, and Ann Miller would say, when we practice, we wouldn't perspire, honey. We would just drip buckets of <laughs> sweat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, oh my goodness. There is something about that number two that just, it sort of speaks to them co-choreographing <laughs> in that and that they're sort of doing this challenge thing. Like yes. One will do a, a step and then the other will do, you know, like do it. It's a, what they are doing is they're doing it's it's they, yeah. people call it a challenge, but it's actually a round. Ah. Oh. Yeah. They're doing a, a time step and then one offsets on the time step, adding a little extra ball change. And then that offsets them. So what it looks like is that as they're doing this that one gets offset, so they go, like if you wash my hands, they go, dum, bum, bum, dum, dum, bum, bum, dum, dum, bum, bum, so they're doing this, and then one keeps going, and then the other one keeps going, and then the other one keeps going, so they keep adding on until they get together, and then they keep going and together. It's really fun to watch, okay. So Fred Astaire and Eleanor Powell only made the one film as a team. I know. Why? Because <laughs> if they were so fantastic and so equally and beautifully matched, why didn't they make more? Now, I know he made a ton with Ginger Rogers, two with Rita Hayworth. Did he just not want to be a team, quote unquote, with another? I think it's a good question. I, or, that's a good question. And I think um, it could be for a variety of reasons. You're trying to get their schedules together. She um, she was a star. He was a star and trying to get that line up. And also there was that, God, that was perfect. You know? And, and so who knows what, what, was going on at that time that prevented it, but it was perfect and we got it. Another one, I know it's not an Eleanor Powell thing, but there was another marvelous tap dancer in England, Jesse Matthews. And there was yeah. always, yeah, there was always a, a, this speculation, wouldn't it would be wonderful if they made a movie together mm -hmm. and they could just never get all the details. It together. seemed like it wasn't a matter of budget because some of these movies from the forties were absolute all out extravaganzas with yeah. a zillion stars, a zillion different <laughs> songwriters oh, yeah. involved. Yeah. But aren't we glad? And we're just so lucky that we have this one because it's not only is it just the two numbers they do together, but she does a solo, he does a solo, he, he does a number with George Murphy. There, it's just when you watch it, you're reminded, oh my God, it's one musical number after another, and not just one musical number after another, but one great musical number after the other. And then it's got Frank Morgan in it, who the Wizard of Oz, uh, who just plays a wonderful character actor. Which, in now, this which film was that again? That was this Broadway, Broadway Melody of 1940. One thing that I notice about Eleanor Powell in her films is the joy that she shows when she dances. Because even if she is working so hard, which I'm sure she was, it doesn't destroy. I mean, you just see this, what I would describe as you could do it. Unbridled joy. joy. Unbridled joy. joy. <laughs> But that's it. I mean, that was that was the unlike today. The motto in those days was "Hide your hard work behind your artistry." Mm -hmm. So never let them see you sweat. That's blah, true. Blah, 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 blah. You're here to entertain them, and so that was just that was the way it was back then. Dancers now have a different kind of. Uh, they can interpret their artistry in different ways. But that was that was her, and I think that if you look back at all the dancers from the 1930s, you'll see that same joy. But yeah. you know, she's. One of the ones that just blew my mind, you know, where you just go, this lady is an absolute athlete. Yeah. Uh, was the Ship Ahoy number oh. with uh, uh, Buddy Rich, the drummer. Yes, that's one of my favorites. 
And it's just st okay. stunning. Um, okay, feeds that she does. Okay, if we talk about this number first, half, <laughs> let's just. So she's there at a, on a ship, and there's a swimming pool, and there's all these bathing beauties around the swimming pool, and you have Red Skelton and Bert Lar standing by, looking adorable in his beret. <laughs> and there's Buddy Rich in his band, and he's playing drums, and she starts tap dancing to him, and then she goes over and starts dancing around the swimming pool. So she jumps on chairs and is tap dancing. I can't step on a chair. What are you talking about? Jump on a chair and tap dance. So she gets up and down on these chairs and flicks her heels on the chairs. And then she goes over to the diving board of the pool. And there's all these girls in bathing suits and they're all doing like a like maybe a little time step or something. And she goes out on the diving board and they all jump and dive into the pool. And she jumps and dives and you think, is she really gonna go in the pool? No, somebody, a big strong man and he catches her in a beautiful swan dive catch. And then they throw her around these guys and she's, doing all this she's acrobatic throwing, like, stuff discs and yeah discs that's all this yeah they she's <laughs> like in the circus catching discs discs and then finally she gets back over to buddy rich and this part i love so much because they do this little trade with the sticks where he's in and she's got sticks and then she gives him the sticks and as she gives him the sticks somebody from off stage throws her two more sticks she literally is doing all of this stuff she, she, put a, she grabs the sticks and then they go at the end and I'm thinking, like, when, like, where, what, how many times, and then you just know that's what that was about. You practiced it until you couldn't do it wrong. Well, that's the, okay, the definition that's uh, the, the difference between an amateur and a professional. An amateur practices until they get it right. A professional practices until they can't do it wrong. Well, if any of you do needlepoint, that would be great to put on a pillow. There you go. <laughs> Words of wisdom. Also, just that, that that also brings out that that there's an element of per, being a percussionist. Yes. Yeah, uh, as a musician. You, yeah, when you're a tap dancer, you're a dancer and a musician. That's it. There you go. I have learned so much about tap dancing, about the art and artistry of making these incredible musicals from you, Rusty. Mm -hmm. The music from you, Janet. Thank you so much, ladies. This has been delightful. Oh. And thank you so much, all of you, for tuning into Hollywood Kitchen. Please keep watching for more food, fun, and film history. When you find that your mind keeps you worried and blue, you can always let your feet keep your disposition sweet. Wanna see what makes me feel the way I do? Kindly cast an eye on two good reasons why. Happy feet, I've got those happy feet. Give them a low down beat, and they begin dancing. I've got those ten little tapping toes. When they hear a tune, I can't control. The dancing heels save my soul. Weary blues can't get into my shoes because my shoes refuse.
I've been told When they hear it too 